Building Men is brought to you by Finish the Race Apparel, ftrapparel.com, the creators of all things Building Men, and by Become Stronger Industries, become-stronger.com, the creators of handmade steel maces, hammers, and other badass equipment. To cultivate depth takes time. It takes courage. Vulnerability is a superpower. Most of us men associate vulnerability with weakness. And I understand why there's reasons for that. I don't fault us for that, that conception, but vulnerability is our superpower because we, we, we reveal the depths of our, as we reveal the depths of our own human experience to another, we're, we're cultivating something in the way that we're communicating and engaging with each other and revealing our heart. But that, that the capacity to cultivate depth takes time. It takes courage. I have to be willing to reveal what's actually happening for me, not the facade I need you to see so that I f stay safe in my own head. I think that is a skill men can learn. Are you ready? You're listening to the Building Men Podcast with Dennis and Anthony Meralda. Brothers on a mission to help you become the strongest version of yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Finally, we are introducing The Foundation, a powerful online virtual community for young men in middle school and in high school who want to become the strongest versions of themselves mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Young men who see themselves as leaders in their family, in their community, in their school, and in the world. It's for young men who know that they are destined for greatness. What young men will experience in the foundation, powerful virtual community is the foundational building blocks of masculinity, improved self-confidence, expert mentorship and coaching, improved relationships, understanding and dealing with stress, deeper self-awareness, improved communication skills, improved healthy habits, some mindset work, improved clarity on career and purpose, physical fitness and nutrition guidance, and connection to a strong community. The group will meet starting on Sunday, March 5th, 2023, and will run every two weeks, but feel free to join at any time. There'll be high-end guest speakers, group discussions, questions and answers, and one-on-one -on -one accountability check-ins. The cost of the program is $47 per month. There's risk-free money-back guarantee if you're not satisfied after the first month. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email, buildingmencoach at gmail.com. Go one step further than you thought you could go. What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Building Men Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Dennis Meralda. I'm joined today by Brian Reeves. He's a former U.S. Air Force captain and quote unquote, dark night of the soul survival. We'll talk about that on the episode today. He's an author, blogger, life relationship coach, and workshop facilitator. He's written a couple books. One is choose her every day or leave her a guide for your journey through the transformational fires of love and intimacy. Tell the truth, let the peace fall where it may, how authentic living creates the passion, fulfillment, and love you seek and the sex flirting dating hunting and hoping diet give up the insanity and get your life back all really interesting titles an interesting dude i was on his podcast recently we connected through my main man jamie gruber and i have a man crush on this guy i will tell the audience that right away it'll come across in the podcast brian what's up my man What's up, Dennis? Likewise, man, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Uh, you know, I I don't often do my interviews myself with uh, with men I'm brand new to, I, but we were introduced just recently and we had one brief, you know, 20, 30 yeah. minute conversation and I was instantly like, okay, all right, I, I like what you're up to. I like what you're doing, supporting young men uh, and, and let, let's dance. Let's see. And yeah, man, I, I our conversation uh, was easily one of my favorites, I think, because of just who you are, how you show up, your willingness to be vulnerable and to and to and to to, to you know, sh share and teach not just from the books you've read, but from the experiences that you've had. So, uh, man, I really enjoyed it as well. And y'all can check that episode out, our conversation on my podcast on called Men This Way. 
that's that will have just come out when this one's coming out. Right. So anyway, it's fun fun to do this the podcast swap thing with you. Absolutely, and it's interesting. I needed I needed to take a, a minute after our podcast yesterday. After it was over, I went for a little walk and just gathered my thoughts again because the direction we went there were a couple times that I got emotional and choked up during the episode yeah. and me two three years ago i wasn't ready to go to that space i wasn't comfortable in that uncomfortable environment and some of the questions that you asked really got me in a space of of emotion and you created a space that was comfortable for me to go there so i wanted yeah. to credit you for that and also for sharing your own vulnerabilities during that and i do believe there's there's such power in the the balance between strength and vulnerability for men. And you do a lot of work with men right now, and we'll dive into a lot of the things yeah. that you're doing. But to start with, one thing that I noticed on the episode yesterday, Brian, when we were talking was I was sharing my experiences about my upbringing with my father, right? And we, that's how I started the episode out. And the, the audience of Building Men knows that story. And you said you had, you alluded to something similar, that you had challenging mm -hmm. upbringing, you had mm -hmm. challenging relationship with your own father. So if you don't mind taking mm -hmm. us back in, in time a little bit to let us know who you were growing up, because you, you went through a journey and then you wound up going into the military. So talk to us a little bit about that yeah. time frame as you were growing up. You know, yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we can only make sense of in looking backwards at, right? I mean, we're just, we live through them. And, and, and if we do the introspective work as adults, we can look back and make sense of, of, oh, okay, that explains so much of what I'm experiencing now, like in my intimate relationships, because of what happened when I was four years old, my, my family split at four years old, my world was cleaved in half. And the seeds of that have been the seeds that were sown the night my dad left at four years old, and then subsequently how he was essentially by and large, missing absent from my life growing up. Um, even as my my stepfather came into the picture when I was about 10 years old, and, and I want to preface all this, I love these men, they're both still alive. I love them. You know, our relationships are what they are. They're, 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 they're at times fraught. And, and um, I'm closer with my stepfather than I am with my father. And I love them both. They have good hearts. I mean, they mean well. They're, I love them. I can't say that enough. And these motherfuckers let me down growing up. They were, you know, I grew up with the sort of this uh, schizophrenic experience of manhood. O on one side, I had the dominating, conquering, tyrant, masculine presence of a man that used fear to get his way and to control and to keep order. And on the other, I had the, the weak, impotent pushover of a man who was just hard to respect. All right, these were my two models of manhood. And on some level, I just instinctively knew, man, I don't, neither one of those are workable models of for what it is to be a man. Neither one of those feel good in my body. Again, I didn't, I couldn't have articulated these words back then, but that was the paralysis that I grew up inside of that persisted, you know, well into my twenties and thirties and in, it affected because it infected my relationships with women as well. And I was, I mean, I was a, captain in the world's most powerful air force um and still uh just painfully impotent in a way in my relationships with women and i don't mean physically impotent like i couldn't get an erection i mean i felt a lack of power right in how i related to women and 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 the results of that were consistently chaos. It's interesting, Brian, when I when I work with educators, now I talk about this balanced approach to discipline. And I give two examples, there's the autocratic educator that is that fear based, the the person that you spoke about in the beginning. And then there's the permissive teacher who is the latter one that you spoke about the mm -hmm. impotent, you know, very the pushover guy. Mm -hmm. And neither one of them is good in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And they both create 
uh, children who are who are one scared on one end, they're afraid to uh, to be themselves, and then they wind up resenting and pushing back against that fear base mm -hmm. where it's like f you, you son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, children learn to be narcissistic and and self serving and manipulative because they can they can get whatever they want. There's no level of of accountability. Yeah. So it's finding that sweet spot. And so having the dichotomy of both as you were growing up must have really done a number on you. So if you were to go back in time, yeah. like we keep in the time machine here, if you were to go back in time, what did young Brian need? What's one or two things that you really needed to learn during mm -hmm. that time in your life, those formative years that you had to learn the hard way as you were growing up or past, past your Air Force career? You know, my, my best friend who I met at 10 years old, right, right, right in the middle, in the thick of, of th this painful polarity <clears throat> that I was living inside of this confusing and paralyzing polarity. My best friend was turned out to be a, my bully. He started out as my bully. He was this angry, uh, bigger, physically bigger, angry child who who really needed a friend and i was this you know weak scared easily intimidated kid who really needed someone to stand up for him and although th this guy's name is tate he's actually my co-facilitator we've been lifelong friends 38 years now and he actually we, we co-lead men's work together now but what we what we what we t the reason that i i bring him up is because what i needed I needed a, a man to stand up for me. I needed a man who would not do my work for me, would not <clears throat> do my growing up for me, would not, you know, you, you shared how you've, for, for your children, you've never talked to their teachers on their behalf. That really sticks with me. I didn't need someone to do my, to do the dirty work <laughs> or to do the, the adult work that I that you need to learn at a, at a certain age or to the, at least the, to take responsibility. But I did need somebody to model strength for me. Tate modeled strength for me as we became friends, as we eased through the 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 bullying part of our relationship and he was only bullying me because he needed a friend right i mean he the way we tell the story is kind of funny he made me be his friend he he made me invite him over to my home for a sleepover and then you know i put uh, this was back in the 80s so we didn't have yoga mats but we had those old thick green exercise mats back in those days that had imagine all of how the... much bacteria how much was swimming in those <laughs> things i can remember them right now they're disgusting yeah they had they had they were if you recall a lot of them had like the exercises drawn out on the mat in like this white sort of paint anyway i put that on the floor next to my bed for him to sleep on well he dragged me out of my bed and made me sleep on that while he slept in my bed like that was kind of our relationship but yeah. as we eased through that and, and we settled into a friendship you know, I, I, I softened him in the ways that he needed to soften and he strengthened me in the ways I needed to, to be strengthened. And that's what neither of my fathers right. were able to do. Did you ever and, have that, uh, Scott Farkas and Ralphie moment from Christmas story where he, Ralphie stands up to the bully. But what, did that happen? Was there a moment that you remember was you were finally like, listen, I'm sick of this shit right now. Or was it just like slow erosion of, of like kind of balancing off each side? It was a slow erosion. I never had that standing up to the bully moment. I mean, I, I wrestled in high school and I, I actually beat one of the kids who was a bit of a, a neighborhood bully in a wrestling match. That was a moment of triumph and surprise to everybody. I'll never forget as the referee raised my hand at the end of the match, he looked at me and said, you suck. And I was like, I just beat your ass. You know, in my head, I was, my I was in shock. In the air. I was like, but I'm the one who just won. <laughs> I suck. You know, that was kind of a fun moment. But but no, it, it, it was really, man, I, 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 I had to walk a path of, of cynicism and pain and isolation and, and shutdown, emotional shutdown. I mean, going through college, I went to a, a largely mostly men's school. Uh, it was a very technical school, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. 
and then I went into the military as a as an Air Force officer. And you know, by the time I was twenty six, Dennis, I couldn't feel a damn thing. I was so emotionally dead. I couldn't. I definitely couldn't cry. Right, that's familiar to a lot of men. But you know yeah. what? I also couldn't really laugh. I mean, I could laugh from the neck up, but I would, I would have to take mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms, maybe, I don't know, many years later after I'd gotten out of the military to discover a laughter that I didn't even know I, I hadn't, didn't have access to. So, you know, my, my journey through childhood as a boy and, and then a young man was, was ultimately, it's not safe to feel. I need right. to shut myself. I need to shut everything down. And that's something similar a lot of young men are going through is that it's the fear <laughs> of showing emotion, the fear of feeling weak. It's a real thing. And it made me think about uh, a story, Brian, that I, I haven't told on the podcast yet. And as you were talking, it, it, it entered my memory. I brought up the quote yesterday on your, on your podcast, but I was at a bar uh, with Julie, my girlfriend, and we're sitting next to a woman who was a teacher. And we're strike up conversation with her. And as we're talking, she she tells us a story. Julie's a labor and delivery nurse, right? So she, you know, deals in the one of the most intimate moments in people's lives, the birth of their children. She's there and understanding relationship dynamics in that moment, which is totally fascinating. Um, the stories that she tells me. So they're having a conversation, and this woman says that. She was told by her her doctor as she was six or seven months pregnant, five, whatever the, the time frame is that they do the test, that she was going to have a baby with Down syndrome. So mm -hmm. she was told in that moment, your child will have Downs. And they were giving her information about how to abort the child. Mm -hmm. And she went through this whole thing and, you know, how people's feelings are on abortion, and, you know, like you feel how you feel about it. But she said she had a, a moment of grieving and she called it the loss of what she thought because she had this idea of this healthy baby that would come out and she would see this kid, you know, play sports and graduate high school and go on and have grandkids one day. And she had to shelf all of that in the moment yeah. and recognize she needed to grieve what she thought was supposed to happen in her life yeah. and then appreciate the, the joy and the wonder that she has in front of her. And her son was born and he became this gregarious, unbelievable human being that brought so much joy into so many people's lives. Mm -hmm. But she had this moment of like, well, this is what I thought it was supposed to be. And I need yeah. to understand it. it's a loss of what I thought. So can you pinpoint a moment in your life that you felt that loss of what you thought you thought your life was going to be in a specific way and yeah. it wasn't, and you had to mourn for it, but ultimately it became something that was a gift more than a sacrifice. hundred percent. Uh, boy, there's so many little rabbit holes I want to jump down on based on what you've just shared, but we'll, we'll stay with your question. So at, at, let's see, I guess I would have been 21 or 22. So I've just done four, four and a half years of university. Uh, the air force paid for all of it. And now I'm, so I'm on the hook to, to pay them back with, with active duty service. And I was already dying. And so I'm a 21 year old kid. I'm, I'm, you know, as they say, full of piss and vinegar, man, I want to go out and save the world. I've got so much life and energy and excitement. I have big ideas. You know, I was the guy at my college amongst all my friends. I was kind of the weird one because I had inspirational quotes all over my walls. This is in what? 1990. Three, there was no Instagram. That shit's all over people's right. Instagram feeds now. But there was none of that. I had to, I had to, you know, print the type those up on a computer, print them out on some old dot matrix printer, and then tape cut them out with scissors and put them on my wall. Like I had to work for <laughs> work for inspirational quotes, you know, thirty years ago. So I was just full of life, man, full of excitement, wanted to go out to take on the world and live my dharma, live my, my, my passion, my purpose. I didn't know what that was. I just knew there's something for me here to live. Uh, but the military was like, nope, you have a contract with us. You are going to spend the next five years of your life wow. uh, doing the work that we tell you to do. I didn't really get a say in that. And where I first got sent Man, it was uh, probably January of what year would that have been? 1996, January, cold, dreary January of 1996. I drove from Arizona where I went to school to Oklahoma City, where I was going to be first be stationed, Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City. 
I went to work in a Cold War building that was uh, a mile long by a mile and a half wide and had seven windows. Just a giant concrete monstrosity with seven windows inside of which I sat at a cubicle in amidst oceans of cubicles. And my, my supervisor comes to me with a giant tech manual, a book that one of the biggest books you'll ever see in your life. Some, a lot of people haven't even seen a book that big, dropped it on my desk and said, start reading. And it was just a dry technical manual for the KC 135 aircraft, man, my life may as well have been over the life, whatever life I had dreamed for myself, drudgery was now my reality. And um, I would mourn that for years. I would suffer through that for years when I got out of the military. And look, I'm proud of my service. You know, I, 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 I separated honorably, I performed well, I did my duties, I, I was a good soldier and all the things. But it was, it was a very painful time for me. And when I got out of the military at 26, five years later, I was, as I said, shared earlier, I was dead. I was angry at God. I remember I was going to have a, I, as my separation date came, I, I was now stationed in Florida at Patrick Air Force Base, right on the beach. And I thought, you know, the day I walk out of this base for the last time, I'm going to go sit on the beach and I'm going to have an angry conversation with God. And I'm going to give that mofo a piece of my mind. Like, what the hell was that all about? Why did you have me do that? That day came, I went out to the beach. I was so dead, I didn't care. I was like, you know what? I, don't, I can't even be bothered to have this conversation. I'm just going to get in my car and go. And 30 days later, I had a nervous breakdown in a phone booth in North Wales because I did not know who I was anymore. I did not know where I was supposed to go. I couldn't go back, but I didn't know where to go forward. I was utterly, utterly lost. Today, I understand. Look, I still wouldn't have designed it that way. <laughs> Right, right. And I am so grateful for that journey because the work that I do as a men's coach, the work that I do as a relationship coach for men particularly, I think has it, it gives me a a a grounded experience in 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 a man's reality when he is doing all the things he's supposed to be doing and he's still miserable or it's still not working. I know how, I know how to empathize with that man. I know how I, I know that experience. I know what it's like to, to, to where everything on the outside looks fine, but in the inside, I just feel darkness or, right. or emptiness at best. I know that viscerally, and I believe that that makes me a better servant in the work that I do because I don't, that can't be bypassed, man. We can't just pretend that ain't happening and, and go live our best life. Right. And that, that phone booth moment is real. And I, I shared it with you yesterday. I had a phone booth moment and it was in a, you know, yeah. a 2011 Honda Accord with 180,000 miles on it <laughs> as I was crying driving somewhere. Yeah. But looking back, that moment shaped who I am today. Yeah. And in that moment, I, if you were to tell me, you need to go through this right now to get to where you're supposed to be, I wouldn't have believed it, but mm. that was your moment. You needed to go through that. And those of you listening who might find themselves in that phone booth moment recognize mm. there is goodness on the other side of that. You have to feel into what you're going through right now to be able to come out on the other side. Before I, I move on past that, Brian, I just... I mean, you talked about having inspirational quotes up on your wall in college. I think I had a gigantic poster that said something along the lines of beer really big. And then underneath it was like helping <laughs> white guys dance in 1776. Like I think that there was right. like, and like Ben Franklin was holding up, you know, pints and, and yeah, dancing. Yeah. That's, that it's was the difference. Appropriate. Right. right. Age appropriate. You mentioned, you said 
as I was asking that question, there were a million different rabbit holes that you started to think of. <clears throat> Not, I won't typically do this on a podcast, allow a rabbit hole to open, but having a conversation with you uh, yesterday on your podcast, I want to, I want you to have the opportunity to open up a rabbit hole. W uh, what was one of the things that you were thinking about when I said that? Well, uh, this, this, this gateway to grief as one of my beloved teachers and mentors, his name is Francis Weller. You should have him on your podcast, Francis Weller. Uh, he wrote a book called um, The Wild Edge of Sorrow. And he, in, in his book, he, 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 he shares uh, the five gates of grief. These are five avenues by which we come to grief. And, and the, the, in no particular order, and I may not even remember all five of them right now, but you know, the first one we, we tend to all be somewhat aware of and, and the way he languages it is um, everything we love, we will lose. That's a gateway to grief. You know, you love someone, you either break up or they die. That's we, we know, okay, that, that there's grief in now. I say we know, but truth is our culture, we love to rush past the grieving process as quickly as possible. Get through your five stages and be done with it. And if, if you don't have to go through all five stages, and by the way, the five stages are, are a bit of a farce, but anyway, just let's, you know, we're, we're, uh, Stephen Jenkinson, uh, he wrote a book called Die Wise. He says we are death phobic and grief illiterate. Graf death phobic and grief illiterate. So, you know, you were talking about grieving. You were talking about this woman who had to grieve the promise of a life, at least the imagine the fantasy of a life. Well, that's actually one of the other gateways of grief, a uh, gates of grief is what was what was expected or promised that we didn't receive. Now that could be parenting. That could be, you know, you and I, there's a there's a, a blueprint, a, a genetic, a very primal expectation or promise that we will be fathered. At least as humans, we're not lizards. I mean, lizards have babies and then the babies, they don't have, they don't parent their children. <laughs> I've known a couple dogs over the years to also, you know, pop out the pups and parents are nowhere to be found. But humans, we generally come with the, the, the blueprint prompt, like we need parents or we'll die. We can't fend for ourselves for years. Well, how many of us didn't and still aren't beneficiaries of that promise right that that is a gate to grief right and i think until you know come coming back to the topic of men and fathers i think this is one of the essential inquiries that we men must embark on as adults is 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 grieving the father's we were promised, but never had. Building men of character, integrity, strength, compassion, and empathy through coaching, mentoring, professional development, facilitation, and motivational speaking is our mission here at Building Men to work with me. Information is in the show notes on our website at buildingmen.io, or you can send me an email at buildingmencoach at gmail.com. We are here to help you become the strongest version of yourself mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Now, back to the show. Grief is one of those emotions. It's it's such an interesting emotion. It's the one that I think we have the toughest time with as human beings and more in particular men. I, I mentioned my relationship with my father, and I remember very uh, vividly times during my life when we had a death in the family. And the way that my father handled the death, he didn't know how to emotionally sit with what happened. He would get angry. Yeah. I, I remember when my grandparents died and when my uncle died and my, he, he would pick fights with my mom during that time. He didn't know how to sit with what was going on. And I remember there was a, there was a death and then there was fear associated with his reaction to the grief and to the death. And I, I was always fascinated. Yeah. Why, why is that the case? What was he missing in his life? And so based on that, I mean, you mentioned Francis Weller, and I, I'm definitely going to look into what he's doing. Mm -hmm. if, the, if there is a man out there that's dealing with grief, is there, are there any piece of advice you can give? Is that something that you cover in your mm -hmm. program, just that dealing with that emotion at all? Yeah. So 
when 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 men come to work with me uh grief is not something we skip over um grief is something we we actually we honor and we hold great reverence for there's a in my book choose her every day or leave her there is a chapter titled men must learn to grieve everything you know i'm i'm 48 i don't think it was until my early 40s that i began to actually grieve all of the loss that i have experienced in my life and look i i've been largely spared or at least death has has largely stayed away from my intimate circle for the most part in other words i haven't lost any immediate family members or i've lost a few friends over the years but even those have been been quite few i, I death is coming for me and mine soon enough but you know so far first first 50 years of life i've been pretty fortunate in that regard that said dennis i have I have lost so many friendships. I have, there are so many people because I've moved so much. Just as an example, I've moved. I've lived in so many places. I've lived in different countries. I've lived all over the US. Um, there are so many people that I may never see again that I loved at one point in my life. Maybe they're somewhere on the planet, but I don't get to enjoy those relationships anymore. Man, the, the, the grief of that, that I didn't even notice began to wallop me a few years back. And one of the things that I didn't realize though, was that my lack of grieving, my lack of honoring what has been lost, you know, what I have loved that I have lost is that it affected my intimate relationships. Again, it comes, come again, my, my work, I specialize in, in, in intimacy, intimate relationships. And so I'm always fascinated about how all of these different things from our spirituality to addiction to grieving, how those impact all the, the, the quality of our intimate experiences, our intimate relationships. And men, when we, as we don't grieve and we just gloss over the things that, that, that deserve our grieving, well, we shut down. You know, you tell the story of the of the father, your father, who got angry at grief. Yeah. It, it, it immediately what jumped forward to me is I've, I've worked with women over the years. I can't, man, I've heard countless times women tell me of the story of the father sitting at the table who couldn't be with the little girl's joy. Would get angry because she and her sister are laughing at the table or making goofy faces and smack her on the head. I mean, that, that is a, 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 a widespread narrative. You know, the, the man who can, can't just be with death and pain and, and, and sadness, but also can't really be with joy and exuberance. Those go together, right? Those go together as, 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 I'm, as I'm able to carve out in my being the, the space for sadness well what what lives right alongside that is i'm also carving out space for joy right and, and gratitude i find it interesting too i wasn't thinking about grief in relation to previous friendships that mm -hmm. have that have basically run their course mm -hmm. uh, it's something that i struggled with po post-divorce there uh, i was friendly with uh, friends with several guys in town and it was the friendships were more geographic in nature we lived in the same block we had kids around the same age our wives hung out together so it was more an issue of convenience than of of most other things and once the the divorce was was out there was finalized it was like a curb your enthusiasm episode where, you know, Jeff and, you know, Marty Funkhauser go with Cheryl. They, they, they choose Cheryl instead of Larry David and it's a whole thing. But I had that feeling of like my friends chose my ex, like they're the partnerships mm -hmm. chose. Mm -hmm. And at first I was really angry at that. And mm -hmm. I, why aren't these guys, I'm hurting right now. I'm struggling mm -hmm. with my life and trying to put pieces back together in a million different ways. Why aren't they reaching out to me? What did I do? Like I went through that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Then there's a quote. I don't, I can't pinpoint the author. Or it might've been from a movie and it's something along the lines of 
a man can never walk in the same river twice mm. because when he tries to, again, the river's different or he's different. Mm. And it made me think about those friendships that had come and gone. And what I needed to do was grieve through that friendship. Uh, you know, it yeah. served a purpose in my life at a period of time. And now it's over and it's run its course. I can honor it. I had a good time with these guys for a couple of years. And now I'll, I'll move on and, and look for other yeah. ways to meet that mm. need. So I'll use that as a segue into how men deal with friendships in their life. Because what yeah. I've noticed is especially mm -hmm. guys that are, they, they have their college buddies or their buddies that they would hang out with when they were younger. And then they get into a partnership, a relationship, a marriage, and it seems like it fades and men don't prioritize male friendships in their life. Is that something that you notice as well in the work that you're yeah. doing? Yeah, my my uh, in, in our work, we, we quote this article that, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years old, um, uh, man, I'm going to mangle the title here, but it's something to the effect of why, why men don't have friends and why women should care. Something to that effect. Yeah. Basically in that article, it points out how after college men essentially stop making friends. We'll have, we might have work friends, maybe gym friends, drinking friends, but we really stop cultivating real friendships by and large, you know, after college. The, the word that comes to my mind as I think about men and friendships is the word depth. We're really practiced at staying shallow with each other, staying on the surface. How you doing, man? Oh, I'm good. Everything's cool. How's a job. How are the wife and kids? Good, good, good. Oh, it sucks. My boss is an asshole. Oh, hey, yeah. Hey, yeah, mine too. Yeah. If, uh, you know, did you see the game this weekend? Oh, yeah. yeah great. Yeah. yeah. Did you see what Dak Prescott did? Right. Yeah, right. Great. Fine. Nothing wrong with any of that stuff but we don't cultivate depth. And I would say, and I'm probably quoting someone here, man, social media has fried my brain for, for attributions, but uh, um, the, the, the deeper our, our love, the greater our grief. The deeper our love, the greater our grief. And when we're having shallow friendships with other men and they just, you know, we stop having those friendships, well, there's not much there to grieve because we didn't cultivate any depth. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm not missing anything because there was nothing really happening. You were just stones skipping off the surface of each other. So yeah, I mean, man, I can fucking throw a million stones anywhere, but to cultivate depth takes time. It takes courage. You know, we talked about, we opened this podcast talking about vulnerability. Yeah. Vulnerability is a superpower. Most of us men associate vulnerability with weakness. And I understand why there's reasons for that. I don't fault us for that, that conception. But vulnerability is our superpower because we, we, we reveal the depths of our, as we reveal the depths of our own human experience to another, particularly someone, look, I wouldn't reveal the depths of my experience in conversation with a man who can't hold it, who's just going to look at me and go like, dude, fucking get a shrink. Yeah. Or, hey, what are you, a fag? Exactly. Yeah. Like I'm not having a, I'm not going to have a depth conversation with a guy like that. Yeah. I'm not interested because just it's pointless for both of us. It's a waste of both our times. <laughs> right. But with another man, like you and I, like we can, we, we are, we're having depth conversations and um, we're, we're cultivating something in the way that we're communicating and engaging with each other and revealing our hearts. And I know we're doing this, you know, publicly, there's a, there's a sort of a contrived, podcasts are a bit of a there's a there's a contrivance to them but still man plenty of people do podcasts and still don't cultivate any depth in their conversations but that that the capacity to cultivate depth takes time it takes courage i have to be willing to reveal what's actually happening for me not the facade i need you to see so that i f stay safe in my own head right um I think that is a skill men can learn, you know, as a, as a coach, what I love and I, I'm, I'm uh, predominantly doing men's groups these days. I'm not doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'm doing a lot of men's work in groups, but I, I find that so powerful because one of the things that I think men are often surprised by when they start to look at it is we don't trust each other. We don't trust other men. You know, it's, it's cliche in the culture that women don't trust men. Yeah, well, what about men not trusting men? Right. We don't talk about that. 
but that's that's just as epidemic as women not trusting men. We don't trust each other. In a a well held container of men, and man, I you know I'd love to be a fly on the wall with what you do with with boys in there. In, in groups, as you do groups of, of boys that are in middle school and high school, I'm not sure. I, I, again, I have no practice. I have no experience in, in how to create that kind of safety for, for boys of that age. I know how to do it for men in their 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s. I know how to create that, that structure within which men can come together in a, in a circle of sorts and begin to really have the conversations they've been dying to have for so long, but they can't have them with anyone because again, they're, they're going to be met with, don't be a fag. Right. Or get a shrink, man. I'm not your fucking therapist or some other kind of, or just, yeah, get over it. It'll be fine. It's nothing. I'm sure it's nothing, you know, nothing gets you over the last woman, like the next one. That's not helpful, <laughs> but that's what most men are met with when we, Let's begin to have try to have real conversations right. and so we just we clam up we shut up yep and it's it it's likely the same pattern that you use with a couple nuances to it working with young men it is it's normalizing their fear of the conversation so mm -hmm. what i will typically do is i will put myself back into a 14, 15 year old mindset. And I will talk to them about what was going on in my life that time, mm -hmm. the the trepidation I had around sharing things that I was thinking. Mm -hmm. And then I tell them what I was thinking. And a lot of them are things that a young man is thinking right now. Right, like the, right. I remember, I remember very vividly being 13 years old. It was like 13, 14 years old. And a lot of my friends had hit puberty. And it was obvious that we'd go to a pool party and you could they had armpit hair, right? And I remember. I was late hitting puberty. I went from eighth grade, I was like five, six, and then ninth grade, I was six, four. It was like, it hit, it hit, and it hit hard, right? But I remember that year, I was really nervous. So I'd go to a pool party. It was like, I didn't want to raise my hand. So I'd try to catch a ball like this because if the girls saw me without armpit hair, they knew that I didn't hit puberty. And now I wasn't a potential sexual yeah. partner for them, right? That's yeah. going on in my head. So I'll tell that story to boys that are 13 years old and they're like, oh shit. I feel the same way or like, mm. like Sean already has a full beard and I don't have pubic hair yet. So they, so for me going through that and talking about it, and then what I do is I tell them how much courage it takes to be vulnerable mm. and, and it is so courageous. And then I use examples of different people in history that have shared their vulnerabilities and how strong those people are. And mm. once I can normalize strength in vulnerability, I get the kids to to lean into the conversation. And there's usually that one kid who takes the risk first. Mm, yeah. And then once the gate is open, then all the kids are like, oh yeah, me too, me too. And all of a sudden you have 25, 30 kids that are 14, 15 years old sharing about these things. And I could just sit back and, and the ship is just steering in that direction. Well, I love it. it. Makes sense. So what I hear is one, you're modeling vulnerability, not, not from a place of poor me. Uh, it, it's integrated. Your experience is integrated. There's no victim mindset mentality. The, the, the wound is, is, you know, healed ish, even if it's still present, but you're, you're spe the adult is telling the story, not the wounded child. So you're, you're modeling vulnerability from an integrated, powerful place. And then you're speaking to the, 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 the power of vulnerability itself. You're calling that out. And I think, I think this is why, you know, men, men are listening. <clears throat> um, I know a lot of men will hear conversations like ours and, and, and men listen to this because they want to have these conversations right. and they don't have anyone in their lives with whom they can have these conversations. And so I, I espouse men's groups do men's work. Um, I mean, it's, it's, there's a, it seems these days there's still a lot more support for women than there is for men, but that's changing. But we men, we need to find each other. <clears throat> we need to come together in safe, trustable spaces. You know, the AA community actually, the the uh, the twelve step community is is an example. It's not necessarily men's groups, although there all are all men's meetings. I understand. Um, um, my stepfather has been uh, sober for thirty plus years. Um, my friend Tate that I just shared, he just celebrated his 20th year of sobriety, going to 12 step programs and, 
And those are examples. I remember I was 17 years old when I went to, my stepfather was just getting sober and was going to meetings. And I went to one of the meetings and I'm 17. This is, this is 30 years ago. This is before, long before social media, even the internet wasn't even a thing. Um, I was watching these people be vulnerable and share their raw experiences and, and making some sense out of it. And I remember thinking, holy moly, everyone needs to be doing this. Everybody needs to be having these conversations. I remember feeling sadness that, you know, for example, like my mom, I love my mom. She's an amazing woman. And, you know, she, because she's not an alcoholic, because she didn't hit bottom in some dramatic fashion, she never went to a 12 step program. I remember at 17 years old thinking, man, I really wish my mom would go to a 12 step program so she could be vulnerable and I could have real conversations with her like this. And I think, I think for a lot of men too, where there's not a, a readily identifiable problem, identifiable problem. Yeah. I drink every day or I have a sex addict or I'm a gambling addict, right? If we don't, if we can't put our finger on the problem, well, then what support? I don't need any support. I'm good. I got this. It's fine. And meanwhile, we're dying inside. We're dying. One of the, one of the refrains I hear most often when, when I get men together and we start having these real conversations is simply, it feels so good to know I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. What a relief. That alone is transformative for men. Absolutely. And I would, I would think, and you correct me if I'm wrong, the reason why this isn't happening more with men taking the risk to have a conversation on a deeper level. So it's more about depth than it is about the breadth of the conversation, right? It's likely the same reason they're afraid to approach the pretty girl in the bar. It's the fear of rejection. Like if I say to you, Hey, Brian, I'm really struggling today. I'm, I'm sad because of something happened or I have this memory of something that happened in my childhood right now. Can you talk about it? Yeah. Me mm -hmm. saying that puts me in such a vulnerable, exposed mm -hmm. state that that could get cut down really quickly. Mm -hmm. And so if it's the blonde at the bar with the big boobs or if it's you yeah. shooting me down, mm -hmm. I still have that fear of rejection. Well, there's another rabbit hole opening up here, Dennis. It's, it's the rabbit hole of belonging. Um, this is not my original work or idea or, or thought, but we're, we're, we live in a culture w in which from a young age, we have to prove that we belong. Indigenous communities, you're, you're born into an indigenous community. And I know I'm speaking in very broad terms here, but indigenous communities, generally, you know, cultures that are connected to the land, you don't have to prove belonging, you belong, the, the, you are the tribe, the tribe is you, there's no separation between the two. Right, that communal living, we, we are the tribe, there is, uh, there's a beautiful saying, every, everything in the forest is the forest. It doesn't have to prove that it belongs. It's the forest. This vine, that bush, that snake, that poisonous insect, that stinging wasp, that beautiful bird. The, it's the, the quicksand. It's all the forest. Well, in our culture that we don't function that way. We constantly have to prove our worth, our worthiness. Um, Francis Weller, my teacher, says one of the, one of the most obscene questions in the human languages and in, in the English languages, what do you, how do you earn a living? You know, what do you do to earn your living? What the fuck right. kind of question is that? Right. Never thought about that. Yeah. So we, we, we are a culture that, that we live in exile. We live in exile. That is the default experience. I live in exile. And if I am going to get belonging, then I have to show up in certain ways. You know, if I'm a man, I need to be making money. I need to be able to get the hot chick. I need to be able to, or, you know, be the best player on call of duty, whatever it is, but yep. I need to have status. I need to be able to show that I can conquer and dominate in some way. I mean, take this to the extreme. You, you get the, the incel movement of, of men, you know, the involuntary celibate movement of men who are so angry that they can't, that women won't sleep with them. This is the mythology. Women won't sleep with me. I'm so, I'm involuntarily celibate. And those men then become violent, but there's a way of, of demonstrating power. 
I mean, that's taken to the extreme. If you notice, my nose is itching. I'm having such an aller <laughs> allergic reaction to something. I keep itching my nose like crazy. But, um, you know, we th th this culture of belonging. And so, yes, I think men, it's terrifying to not belong, to be in exile. <clears throat> and un until we learn to belong to ourselves, I suppose. I guess our, our, in our culture, I think a lot of the work we're up to is coming home to ourselves. I, I, I do belong not because I've made a certain amount of money or because I have a certain wife or a certain job title, but you know, I, I belong because I'm, I'm human and everything in the forest is the forest. You know, that's a spiritual journey, I say. I mean, maybe it's a psychological journey, but for me, it's been a spiritual journey. And, and um, you know, I've, uh, my, my confidence I am such a different man at 48 than I was at even 38. Definitely in 28 or right. shit, 18, I was a joke, <clears throat> as I shared earlier. But this, um, this, I don't, I don't need to prove my belonging anymore. And that, that allows me to be vulnerable in ways that, um, make me in a way kind of invincible because no one can use my vulnerability against me. It can't be done because it's my superpower, because I know that I'm human. I, I guess there, there's a, there's a beautiful, I think, humility that comes along with that, that I'm, man, I'm just as fucked up as anybody. You know, I, I have my, I have my, my days of despair and I have my, you know, my nights of, 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 distraction that you know a man of 48 shouldn't be engaging in on some level it's like you know my brain thinks oh man i'm too old for to be playing video games till four in the morning you know this is going to crush me tomorrow but screw that man i'm human i get to be messy as well you know i, I get to have made mistakes i get to have fumbled my way to 48 and i'm going to keep fumbling my way and man that's that that because of my willingness to be messy and to make mistakes. I don't ever want to hurt anybody. My willingness to apologize, Dennis, when I do make mistakes, because I will. One of the things I've learned in relationship is, man, get, get good at apologizing. Get good at apologies. That is a, a golden nugget, I would say, to take away from, 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 from this. You know, if you're in relationship or want to be in relationship, just get good at saying, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. That was fucked up. Yeah. And and not having to defend every single thing. It's it's okay to lean in and say, I, I messed up here and not have to back it up with because you didn't understand what I was talking about. Exactly. Right? As men, that's what we do. We do that very, very frequently. I'm tempted all the time. Yes. And I know again it what's underneath that is please don't exile me. Please don't kick me out of the circle of belonging. Right. If you would only see what I meant, if you would only see things the way I see them, then you won't pull your love away from me. Because that's what we grew up with. That's what our parents, even, even I mean, our parents are human. Even the best parents are sometimes going to withdraw love when we don't do what they want us to do. Sometimes, we, we, and even if they don't, if they somehow miraculously pull off you know, St. Teresa-like love for 18 years, well, our friends are going to do that. Our teachers are going to do that. Our neighbors are going to do that. So, yeah, man, underneath that protest is just don't exile me. Please right. don't kick me out of our circle of belonging. And when we can start conversating about that, holy moly, now, you know, whether with other men, with our intimate partners, it's like, wow, we're, 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 we're the circle of belonging becomes so much bigger because it, it can now encompass our flaws, you know, it can, it encompasses our humanity. Right. It's interesting. You went down that path too, because as we were talking yesterday on your podcast, you were asking me at the end, you did this rapid fire thing. And it was like, what, yeah. what brings you joy? What makes you angry? What makes you yeah. sad? What are you afraid of? Those kinds of questions. And I thought about it a lot afterwards. And what I, what I figured was, for me, and it, I'm sure it holds true to many people listening, 
if you were to boil down things in your life that are bringing you stress or that you're worried about right now in your life, my guess, if you if you keep going a level deeper asking, well, so what? So why? Why does that? If it's, uh, I'm worried about paying the bills this month. Why? What are you worried about? Like, and you just yeah. keep going down and down. It, it, it's likely one of two things. Mm -hmm. It's the fear for men of feeling weak mm -hmm. or the fear of abandonment. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it's one of those two things. I could be off there, but that's where my head goes as I was I was really taking apart that question that you asked me yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. When I, I've done a lot of mindset work in my coaching work over the years, and one of the one of the core stories, belief systems that that it seems us humans harbor is the belief that I'm not good enough. I, I, weakness, you know, like you said, I'm afraid of being weak. What is that? What I'm afraid that I can't do it. I'm not enough. I'm not up to the task. I'm not lovable. That again, notice the, the, the story of belonging inside of that. I'm not good enough. Therefore I don't belong. I live in exile and in exile is a lonely place. It's supposed to be. That's what it's intended for. You don't get to be in the tribe. And that in a way is our cultural mythology. You have to prove that you belong. And as men are trying to become the best versions of themselves, my advice is do that work on you. Really do the work on yourself before entering into a romantic partnership in as much way as you can. Obviously, we're, we're in a constant struggle with that. We're never the, the ultimate versions of ourselves, but consider it. What are you bringing into the relationship um, to be the best you if you're actually with another human being. So as as you're 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 writing several books about relationships and you're working with men and and how they're showing up in relationships, uh, I don't I I'm ready to to like like schedule for episodes three four five six all the way through because this conversation has been really impactful. Yeah. But I don't want to gloss over your your role in in helping men in relationships and helping partnerships and relationships. So, what are give us a little bit about that that from where you were? You're you're traveling the world. You're in a phone booth. You're you're crying your eyes out. You go on this adventure around the world, and you decide to write, you know, books. Like where did I just I just need to know because we'll set up a second second oh, episode yeah. in the future. No, there was there was a decade between that. Okay, or 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 more maybe 15 years between that the 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 sobbing on the floor of a phone booth in north wales to my first book coming out uh there was disastrous relationships in that 10 15 years there was a marriage to a french woman that destroyed me in the best way in the way i needed to be destroyed um there was other there was working with a lot of spiritual teachers like um eckhart tolle and neil donald walsh and marianne williamson there was there was studying with teachers uh, in in the field of relationships and sexuality, like David Data, uh, Michaela Bowen, uh, way of superior man, way David of the Data. superior yeah. man, yeah. exactly. So, you know, and and look, I agree with you. Look, a man listening, whether you're in relationship or not, start the work now, man. Read yeah. some books. You know, get my book, choose her every day or leave her. Um, um, get the power of now get uh don mcgill ruiz's the four agreements whatever just start somewhere um because you know dennis you you said it also yeah the work doesn't stop like we don't do the work as single men and then we get into a relationship and oh it's all smooth sailing from there it's quite the opposite right. do as much fucking work as you can if you're single because the real work begins in relationship and the more prepared you are for that real work yes the smoother it will go it's still going to be a bumpy ride you know I, I like to think of relationships as as two distinct worlds colliding each world has its own physics you know it has its own atmospheric conditions and when those worlds collide man there is going to be friction and fire and and look not for everybody you know some people it is a pretty smooth transition and the, and the friction and fire maybe comes out later as they start to really get honest with each other or life happens and they have stresses and they have to now navigate their different ways of being but for a lot of us you know the first couple of years of relationship are can be really really challenging and the more prepared we are the more we've cultivated our own depth by inquiry by looking at what what am i not grieving from my past where am I still angry at my father that I'm in denial of or my mother? 
or my brothers or brother or the world, whatever, you know, what am I in denial of that? If I don't clean this up, this is going to, I'm going to keep, I'm going to bring this with me everywhere I go. Love that. It, it reminds me of your analogy reminds me of the movie parenthood with Stephen Martin oh. in the, I want to say it was like mid nineties or something like that. And there's a lot, there's a, a scene at the end of the movie. I think I just called him Stephen Martin, by the way, I need to Steven. adjust that. I don't think he was ever that's called his, Stephen. That's what his friends call him. So you're, yeah. you're in <laughs> or he got, he got in trouble. He was Stephen <laughs> Jack Martin or something. Okay. Um, towards the end of the movie, the grandmother is there in the foyer and total shit shows going on around them. And she just starts talking. She said, I remember going to the amusement park or to the fair when I was younger. And she said, a lot of my friends would go on the Ferris wheel and it was really comfortable. And it just went around in a circle and you got to see the view and it was really pretty and smooth. She said, but I really liked the roller coaster. It was a wild ride. It was up and down and there were bumps and bruises and you're spinning around and you never know which way is up and which way is down. And she was talking about the analogy to life. And so she walks outside and Steve Martin's wife goes, I love your grandmother. She is so wise. That advice was so good. And Steve Martin looks at her and goes, if she's so wise, why the hell is she sitting in a neighbor's car right now? But it's <laughs> like, it's uh, it, to me, that's the relationship. I mean, yeah. could it be a fair, could it be you just, you go around and it's smooth and you know where things are going? Sure. Right. But that's no fun, right? You, you kind of need the bumps and the bruises along the way as you're going through it together. And listen, man, this has been uh, one of my favorite hours on the podcast. When I can come out of an episode, not only connecting with a person, recognizing the true value to the audience, but also learning a great deal. That was an hour well spent. I just want to, before I ask my last question, one, thank you. I appreciate you as a human being, as a, as a knowledgeable man in this space and someone I consider a friend right now. And uh, before I ask my last question, where can we find you? How do we get in touch with you and, and buy your books and, and reach out to you? Well, thank you, Dennis. I appreciate that, man. And it, again, it takes two to have a conversation of depth. I can't, I couldn't do this by myself, man. So, you know, that's testimony to who you are as a man as well. Um, so thank you for that compliment. And I give it right back to you. Uh, my website, Brian. Reeves. It's Brian with a Y, B-R-Y-A-N, Reeves, R-E-E-V-E-S.com. That's one-stop shopping. You can find everything there from my courses for men, uh, coaching with me for men, uh, my book. I also, it's available now in audiobook, which I'm really excited about. Um, in my voice, uh, Choose Her Every Day or Leave Her. I have my other book, uh, Tell the Truth, Let the Peace Fall Where It May as well. Both of those are on Amazon. You can find them on Amazon and most places that, that sell books. So, but brianreeves.com, Brian with a Y, reeves.com. Awesome. Appreciate that. We'll put all that into the show notes for people to click on those links and find what Brian is doing. Last question, Brian, is if someone's listening to the episode, the amount of value that they've received so far is immense. But if they were to press pause right now and there's one thing, that they can do at this moment. And by doing this one thing, it can totally change the trajectory of their life. What's that one thing? Have a real conversation with someone within the next 24 hours. And what do I mean by that? I mean, have a conversation with someone that you know you've been avoiding having. That's one option. <laughs> Some men may not know they've been avoiding a conversation. Right. Some of you do, you know, exactly the one that pops to mind, go have that conversation. Um, or just reach out to another, to reach out to a friend, reach out to someone maybe you haven't talked to in a while. I think this was a big realization too, that I, I, I had so many friendships over the years, but I didn't nurture them. You know, we men are good at putting friendships on the shelf. Right. You know, we'll, we'll come back to them when it's convenient, when we're in the same spot or when we just, you know, I don't know, the, the time rolls around for us to connect again. Well, uh, reach out to someone, ask them, how are they? How are you really doing? And when they say, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. Say, no, 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 no. Really, man. How are you? Like, like what's going on inside you, man? How are you feeling? How's life really? I know, I know you're fine. I know you got shit handled. I know, you know, get past the facade. 
you know, Dennis, modeling that, like you said, for, for the, these young boys, when we begin to be a stand for real conversations, other men are dying, just like these middle school boys are dying to talk about the things that are actually happening for them. Well, so are men. So that would be my suggestion. Appreciate that, my man. Excellent suggestion. Put that into play. Immediately, those conversations are difficult, but those are the ones that you need to have. There's a difficult conversation for a reason. It's need to have that conversation. Yeah. For those of you listening, the first person that sends me an email at buildingmencoach at gmail.com with the subject line, phone book, phone booth moment, phone booth moment, subject line, I will send you a copy of Brian's book on me. Phone booth moment. First person, send me an email. For the Building Men audience, go one step further than you thought you could go. We'll see you next time on Building Men. <laughs>